All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's talk. Um, today is the second talk from the Artist Talk series with Sif Cohort 7. And today we have joining us Sara Ahli, Fatman Ali, and Zainab Abdulaziz. And Nasa Zayana will be co moderating with me. And uh, today's talk is about process and repetition. Uh, we'll be, I mean, the artists will be going through the process that they went through towards their final works that are currently on at Warehouse 421. And uh, we'll be having a Q&A session with them as well. And you'll have time at the end uh, to ask your own questions. So feel free to put those in the chat box or if you feel comfortable at the end to unmute yourself and um, <laughs> ask your question live. That would be great as we want to have a natural conversation. Thanks, Sara. Um... As you said, I'm Nasa Zani, I'm the C Studio Manager. Um, again, thank you all for joining uh, the second of three uh, artist talks. Um, stay tuned for one more coming up on December 14th, right? Yeah. And then um, uh, these art artist talks are uh, around this year's edition of Community and Critique, CIF Cohort 7's exhibition hosted at Warehouse 421. Um, the show is open and will be up until December 20th. Uh, you can book a time to visit through Warehouse 421's website. Um, each of the artists uh, today will introduce their work uh, that you can see in the show, and then we'll move on to a, conver a conversation um, before opening it up to questions uh, from you all um, in the last 15 minutes. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with Sara Ahdi. Um, okay, hi everyone. Hope everyone's doing good. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Oop. All right, so let's, sorry, that's not the beginning. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Salah Hadi. Um, I'm an artist and designer living and working in Dubai. I received my BFA at California College of the Arts, San Francisco in 2015. My work explores feelings of discomfort and pressure while also incorporating a sense of play and humor. So what you see right now is the current work that is at, um, exhibited at Warehouse 421. Um, the five bodies of work collectively explore what it means to exhaust the body uh, in order to fully understand its potential. And um, it, que it questions whether or not um, discomfort can turn into comfort. So I'm gonna walk you guys through my process. Um, every safer that is on here right now, I'm pretty sure everyone loved this assignment. Um, I have to give this assignment as much credit as possible because without the semiotic square assignment, I wouldn't have been able to um, exhibit the work that I'm exhibiting today. Um, so I'm just gonna, if anyone has questions about this process, Nasser will definitely explain it to you later. <laughs> it's a long process. But um, anyways, that being said, um, I was able to create this work, which is, um, which allowed me to kind of explore this idea of space transformation, the body and its adaptations. So I was really interested in what it meant to bag um, these balloons into a vacuum bag. And I was using balloons as a metaphor for the body for me. And so what does it mean to bag one body of air into another body of air? And what does it mean to remove air in one body while preserving air in another and start to see what happens. And what happens is that the two bodies start to communicate with one another through movement. Um, they were able to shift closer to one another and um, they're basically forced to adjust to their environment. So it's a great starting for me in terms of, uh, you know, developing my narrative. And so I decided to find every type of balloon there was on the market and um, kind of, you know, create similar, um, similar balloon sculptures and um, trying to push that forward, the narrative of, of um, the body and its adaptations. And so I put all of them into this one big vacuum bag. And um, I felt that it wasn't, it wasn't going the direction that I wanted. Um, so I decided what would happen if I were to create my own balloon. And so I um, decided to kind of push um, in terms of materiality and play with latex, PU foam, um, rubber, and then plaster. So after doing these iterations, I realized that creating a replica is not exactly um, serving my initial interest. And so I decided to go ahead with 
what I um, know best and plaster is uh, what I decided to work with. And so um, I took the balloons and I filled them up with plaster and I put them in the vacuum bags. And um, obviously they were forced to adapt and this was a byproduct. And I was really interested here because I can see that, you know, the, the, there was a retention of the forced gestures, whether it was, you know, through um, the balloons meshing there, um, what pressure for the balloon, and then the latex or the skin, uh, you know, erupted. So this was um, really interesting for me. And then it sort of to create my um, artwork, which is the balloon baggage. Um, so that's what you have here. And moving forward, um, I wanted to kind of push it forward other than just using more of a plain, colorful, fun balloon. And I wanted to personify these balloons and um, kind of give it something that, you know, is more um, personal and something that is a bit more of like an icon. So I decided to use a smiley face um, balloon that I found while I was actually shopping in the gym. And um, it's, it kind of just overall worked in my favor because um, it allowed me to sort of express that so this artwork is called I'm Fine. Um, and what's, um, I guess, obviously it's not fine. Um, <laughs> but what's funny here is that the, the balloon, um, you can see that it's busted and um, it's starting to rupture through time. So I wanted to just kind of convey that with this artwork. And um, that being said, after pushing my balloons and, and, you know, kind of suffocating them and putting them in this very uncomfortable situation in the vacuum bag, I thought it was very important for me to really understand what does it mean for, you know, this, this medium to, what is it, what does that medium feel and how can I myself as my body um, understand what they're going through? So I decided to um, allow myself to uh, get into a human sized vacuum bag and I was very very uncomfortable um, I had an immense anxiety but once I actually got into the bag and the air was being uh, removed I actually felt very comfortable and so this kind of opened up the question and sort of like overall um, can discomfort turn into comfort and so that's when I decided to kind of push forward this idea of casting my the balloons into the bags and kind of create this visceral fragmented feeling. Um, and so this is sort of what happened manifested after that process is that I was able to create um, the artwork, which is called A Feeling Untitled. Um, and then so speaking of, of sorry I'm just going to go back to this so um, taking this this artwork and placing these fragments that have been you know um, these balloons that have been suffocated in this bag I wanted to place it onto a memory film mattress making it a very intimate um, giving it making it a very intimate space and um, like focusing on the private and making it public um, so I think that was really important for me is to show the vulnerability of these pieces um, so then I kind of pushed forward this idea of the memory foam and thinking about the, the qualities of memory foam and how it always backs, it bounces back to its original form. Um, what happens when you actually, um, you know, restrain the nature of the medium and you deny the not, its natural state. So with this piece, I also wanted to show the viewer um, that sort of message that I was working through. And then with my final work, um, it was really important for me to kind of showcase um, time, body, space, performance with these imposed gestures um, to be done and to be undone. And so this was the performance um, memory film piece, which is called Just For Your Eyes. Um, so I'm just going to end with um, basically overall my work, I don't consider it as any, it's not finished at all, but I do see it as a collective whole, um, you know, like, conveying this message of the body. And um, I wanted to showcase, you know, that this is an extension of my physical body and it's overall an interpretation, it's an examination and, and an experimentation of these embodied experiences. So thank you guys so much for hearing me out. Thank you, Sara. Um, we're gonna move on to Zainab next. to unshare. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello. Okay. 
Um, can you see my screen? Like a full screen or? Yeah. Mm, great, okay. Uh, so the name of my work is called Aswad Munawan uh, or Colored Black and it's about colorism in Sudan. Um, uh, Sudanese people have this uh, tendency to describe other Sudanese people using um, the undertone of their skin. Um, and the four primary ones are yellow, red, green and blue, which is something um, quite odd because I've only seen that Sudanese people use it. Um, but although it can be used uh, to describe um, um, like facial features and whatnot or the undertone, it's, it's also used um, in a racist way. And so uh, I did not grow up in Sudan, but going there like every vacation, I would hear the conversations, see things and like, and so that became ingrained into me, I suppose, or I've gained these habits where I tend to like, have these like microaggressions. And so I wanted to create work about it. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> just gonna show you this because it looks nice. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, the way that I started out was um, through this uh, process of um, playing around with acetate uh, or this clear plastic sheet. Um, uh, it had this interesting duality of like um, reflecting um, the acetate, but also projecting. So you see like two things happening at the same time. And I thought that was something very interesting. Um, and so then while playing around with that um, and trying to project and come up with things, I've also um, played around with the projector and by accident, like while the projector was like just on standby, um, I noticed that the, my facial features under the color blue uh, were basically erased. And that was something that I found like very interesting. So happy accident, <laughs> yay. Um, and so uh, I decided to pursue that even further and taking more photos, it was like a very interesting process. Um, <clears throat> and so I began pursuing the color blue and trying to discover like, okay, what else, if there seems to be something going on, is, what else is there to it? Um, and then I took the photos that um, I've taken under the color blue and printed them out. Um, and I've also experimented with different things with acetate, including typography, um, as uh, shown on the image on the right. And so I printed those images out, which was one of the things that I've done while I was like trying to just sort of understand what was going on. And it came out like the printer basically didn't do it right, but it was, it looked very exciting and visually interesting. And um, it kind of reinforced this idea even further, this erasure of facial features um, and alluding to the concept that I wanted to do. Um, and so, um, we pursue the print passage. <laughs> um, and so then I tried again, but basically with a different printer. And um, essentially when you print on acetate, the ink doesn't bind to the acetate. Uh, it just sits on top. And so when, when you hang it and put it on top, the ink starts to drip. And so, these, this is basically like a documentation of this um, deterioration. Um, and so like the difference between each scan is like, or photo is like one day. And so that would be the result after like three days. Um, and so then 
um, the jump between this to this took five years because I was just mulling over like, okay, blue, hmm, there's something really exciting going on here, but I was not sure. Like, it seemed like uh, not enough, but at the same time, hmm, uh, also not representative of uh, the issue at hand. And so eventually uh, I decided like, okay, let's, after doing some reading and like researching, of course, and uh, I decided to pursue the other three colors, which are basic. Uh, so red, yellow, and green. And I took photos of myself uh, because that was what was there <laughs> at hand. And uh, I experimented with printing, um, different colors, different inks, um, lighting, composition, um, and discovering like what works best, what gives, what gives, um, what allows this deterioration or the print to uh, dissolve the fastest. Um, and so, this is just like a horrible picture of basically what I've managed to accumulate over time. And this is not even like all of them, like there's like others that are still hanging. And um, yeah, and so I began to take multiple photos of myself and um, <clears throat> find the right composition. and. And that in and of itself is was a long process of choosing, eliminating, and whatnot. And then eventually, like, it came down to this. <clears throat> so yeah, ah, um, I'm gonna add a few things as well. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the idea of this uh, ink deteriorating. What was exciting about it? It took a while for it to sit in and re get reinforced with me. Uh, was that it was erasing my features, but also over time, um, if we go back, um, some of these these are all primary colors here, and some of them don't even look like primary colors because they faded over time. And so that was the interesting part for me was that this fading of the color, and that to me, this ink deteriorating or dripping kind of meant like. Uh, this very long, long process of unlearning uh, racism. And, and so I decided, I, while I wanted to go and photograph people uh, with their experience, I also thought if I were to start talking about racism, I need to start with myself. And so this is where I've reached in the process. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, and now we have Fatima next. Yes, give me one second. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Fatima Al Ali and I am a multidisciplinary artist based in Sharjah. I would like to take you through the process of my work that led me to the final st stage of the installation that's shown in Warehouse 421. In my work, oftentimes I work with materiality I, have, I get fascinated with different materials and the possibilities that they bring out and the emotions that they can provoke. The rhyme that is shown on the screen and that we're all familiar with show me, uh, it's filled with metaphors that show me like metaphors of stability and fragility, structure and base. Although it might not be always super present in my work at first class, themes of home and navigating yourself within these limitations on what is yours and what is others what is enforced and what is given are always in the back of my mind. Home is where you're supposed to be safe in. Home is where you are your most authentic self and home is where you are at peace. So that led me to the brick. A brick in its traditional sense is a symbol of life. It's, it's, it's engulfed with elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. It's a simple object of soil and water, yet it can change into different form once, once an outer pressure is added to it. A brick can be more than just a building block. It contains within it texture, dimension, weight, and strength. A brick can also exist as an individual unit and coexist as a collective, creating a whole cohesive pattern. It 
exists everywhere, can be seen and unseen, noticed and unnoticed. A brick can also be the self. I wanted to create my own bricks and to see where that could take me instead of using a ready-made brick that I can find anywhere. I started by making plaster bricks that were hollow from the inside. Although I did that at the beginning for technical reasons, I started questioning it the more I submerged myself within it. What does it mean to have a hollow brick? Plaster in itself is a very fragile material, easily breakable, yet I was making it even more fragile. Although I was happy with the plaster bricks, I felt like I needed more. If the brick was the self, is it always shown? What are the layers that we carry and how many do we have? Does it always fit? So I decided to create skins out of latex for the brick. If the brick is the self, then what happens when it is engulfed? What happens when the skin above it is limitating, imitating its own shape? How much of a difference does it make? I noticed that the more I made, the more questions came up in my head. I first started to make half coverings of the brick. And then I decided to see if I can create a full brick made completely out of latex, yet still hollow from the inside. Will it still have the same shape? Will it still stand the same way a plaster brick would? What did it mean to have a copy of the self? And can these hollow copies be seen as the full self? What if they were the true identity of it instead of the original that was a copy of a copy? Will it act the same way? Some were hard and strong and some were barely standing on their own. The skin itself showed plenty of metaphors. It is a medium which inner and outer world manifests. These shells offer identities. It is a shield, it protects and offer encasement, yet it is intimate. It is surface and depth. After working day and night to no end, to create as much bricks as I can make, whether they are in plaster or latex, I started thinking of ways to show it. At first, I hung the plaster brick in my room as a form of a solid base. And then I started playing around with the latex in ways of how, to, of how it may hang on the brick. Sometimes it was fully covered on the plaster brick and other times it was barely hanging. A single movement could, kiss, could cause the latex skin to fall down. And then I started thinking of placing it on the floor as a sequence showing the process of visibility and layering. Then I placed it in a column. And that when something sparked in my head. Prior to that, I was thinking of the bricks as individuals, but when, what, what could happen if they were like put together as a collective? Space came into question. What did it mean for one brick to overtake the space of another? When it came for the, to the exhibition space and presenting my work, I have been working so far in my room and to be outside and seeing it like in a gallery space was really exciting and intimidating. Um, I wanted to showcase all these questions and findings. I was interested in building a structure that would stand on its own, yet any slight movement might cause it to fall down or collapse. How can the overall shape change the points of tension created by the plaster brick on top of the plaster of the latex brick? What did it mean to have a structure to have, what did it mean for a structure to be barely, barely standing on its own? Yet when you deeply look into it, you can notice the discomfort. Will it stay in the same place? What is the moment of collapse? And can I notice or record it? Another aspect of my work is that I enjoy uniting opposites, questioning the inside versus the outside, the mold and the relief, the system and the individual, the points of strength in opposition to points of collapse. Showing the bricks on their own was as important to me as showing it together in a structure. Different bricks show different selves and different selves show different skins and layers. Working with the latex have been very intriguing and interesting to me since I tend to work, like I, I do work with materiality, but the material on its own invoke or evoke a lot of emotions to me. So when I look at latex, I think of skin. So I am really excited to uh, explore it more 
and see how can it be manipulated further. So sometimes it can be semi-transparent or fully covered. And yeah, that's from me. Thank you, Fatla, and thank you all for uh, sharing your screens and putting together a presentation of your process. I think it's really refreshing, actually, um, to show a process of a work because, sorry for the noise outside, <laughs> we're, uh, we're so used to showing the final uh, work, whether it is in a gallery space or in your own studio. We're so focused on this end product, but in reality, there is no end to a project or so I believe. So thank you so much for sharing that process that people are not so aware of. Um, all right, so we're gonna get to questions. And I know we just spoke a little bit about process, but the title of this talk is Process and Repetition. So um, I've noticed in all three of your works, repetition is quite a prominent element. And um, could you talk a little bit about that and what repetition might mean in your practice? and whoever would like to start can unmute. <laughs> okay, hi, I guess I'll start. Um, so yeah, for me, repetition is, um, it's not repeating the same outcome, but repetition through the making process. So like repetition through method of making. Um, so in, in my case, I would, you know, um, create these, take the balloons and I would create these like structures out of them. I'd put them in the bags. And then that was sort of the same process, but um, the, the outcome was different, you know? So, um, and yeah, and so in this work that's up right now, this is um, one of the earlier works in which I, uh, you know, was exploring repetition through this excessive making of bowls. Um, so the method was in a sense the same. So repeating the same method of taking the balloons, um, you know, um, putting them into the ground, uh, having the plaster around it, but then taking it to each, each different site so that the soil around the, you know, the plaster bowls would be different. Um, or it all, all of a sudden there was no soil, there was no, um, you know, the bricks or earth, let's say it was just solid plaster um, covering itself. So. For me, I would I would stick to um, yeah repetition as method of making rather than like end result. Also, I find it really interesting with your work, Sara, that you began the program using balloons. <laughs> like, yeah. I think when we had to do, I don't know the assignment exactly, but uh, it was one of the first ones, and you were still using balloons and plaster. So it's really interesting to see how that also evolved, how you use this one material, and it started to. Um, create new things, as you said, it's not an act of staying the same, but becoming different. Um, yeah, for sure. Fatma, would you like to add? Anything? Yeah, um, I completely agree with Sarah. Actually, like I didn't notice that I use repetition in my work on this until you, I got like the call to be in this panel. And then I reflected and looked back into the practice that I've been, or the work that I've been creating for Steve. Um, I echo Sarah in saying that repetition to me means using the same method, but not necessarily, not necessarily having the same outcome. So one of the projects that I did was, um, I took this photo that I had from 2001 that I, I took it on my own when I was seven years old, and I scanned and printed, printed it a hundred times, just like to see the subtle changes that happens from one image to another. But then like when you come and see like every ton 10 pages or every 10 images, it would change or like have this drastic um, element to it. And another artwork that I created as well was, um, I was using alginate and alginate to those who are not familiar with it. It's, uh, it's a material that is used to, as a mold for like one time, you cannot use it another time. And I was really interested into trying to record time or like trying to record the memory of it. So I kept on using the same alginate mold over and over and over and over again until like started falling on me. Um, just like to see the different outcomes and how I can see like this unintentional change that could happen over time. Zena. Um, I think I'm also gonna say, yeah, uh, process for me, or even though, or this idea of repetition, you can repeat 
the same thing, but the outcome will always be different, especially when it's done by hand. And so like, this is one example of something I did during SIF, which was an assignment of creating patterns. And so this pattern was created on the computer. It was very easy to generate because like uh, the template is already there and it's automated. Um, but then um, I wanted something a little more organic, something because it was too rigid. And so I actually printed out this object that the pattern was created of and I cut it up and created something new and scanned it and distorted it. And so it turned into something completely different. And from there came new patterns, I think but I think the one where it becomes difficult and that's where I think the idea of repetition for me like becomes strong is when I started to find a site for the pattern um, or a place where the pattern could live. Um, and so I began doing this um, through projector. Again, something very easy where you could generate multiple different images, multiple different outcomes, but then um, I went in and started cutting up these pieces, um, these petals, because they look like a flower one by one, and <laughs> putting them one by one, and um, it was, it I kind of noticed that I was thinking a lot um, while putting this together. Um, which is interesting. Uh, and then again, repeating it over and over and over and over um, while doing by hand is very frustrating, <laughs> but um, there was something there about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna uh, like say, oh, sorry, Nasa, go ahead. No, I was just gonna uh, like kind of add something to that conversation um, and maybe ask you guys a follow-up question because um, I, mean, I know you guys were saying repetition is, is kind of like, uh, you know, doing the same process uh, over and over again and getting different results. But I would argue that you're actually not doing the same process at all, even though it might seem like it's, uh, it's, it's one and the same. But I think every time you do something, you're, you're having a conversation with that material uh, you're asking it questions, it's giving you answers, or it gives you more questions, um, and then you adapt. Even though you're, you might be doing the exact same thing, you're actually learning from each experience. So I'm wondering with, with each one of you, you know, what kind of conversations those were. So you know, if we're talking about Zainab with you know, the, the, um, the pieces that you ended up with and how your process of repetition uh, came from working with the printers and we're working with the ink and trying to find out what works best. Um, so what kind of questions were you asking there? Same thing with Sara, like, uh, you know, uh, working with the balloons, trying to push the, push the boundaries of like, how much can you fill them? How much can you stretch, pull, uh, compress? Uh, same thing with Fatma, you know, like you're, you're adding skin and layers. And so like, um, you know, what makes you stop at two layers of latex versus 20, you know, like what kind of, so you are actually, you know, having those conversations with yourself. You might, you might not um, be actively making note of them, but I, I do definitely think you're, you're actually like making the things differently each time. Um, I don't know whoever wants to start with that one. Just wanted to throw it out. Also, just to add on to that, sometimes, like, especially with Zainab, um, sometimes that you don't have control over the material as well. So that's also a very interesting part in, in the repetition or the repetitive process as well. So if you want to talk about, about that as well. Um, yes. So with the prints, this... Um, I th yeah, it was frustrating to work with the ink, especially when I couldn't control exactly where it would go. Um, uh, and so inherently this, I had to reprint, redo these prints until I was 
somewhat or I was happy with what I wanted and and then I, <laughs> the question is what is it what is that result and at that time when I was first starting out I was trying to push the uh, portraits into becoming as abstract as they can and so pushing this ink and so trying to get the printer to print as much ink as it can as on the acetate and so that took a while and then um and then now and then once i figured it out i had to like immediately i had to be really quick with my hands I, sh I couldn't be clumsy because the ink drips immediately as soon as it comes out of the printer I to scatter and hang and then i have to time myself and then um if i miss a beat it's gone <laughs> repeat again um and so i made a lot of mistakes in that um and so there <laughs> is where repetition is like hmm, <sighs> uncontrollable <laughs> um and at the same time it's like you don't get the same results even after you like you question yourself and try to like try different approaches <clears throat> Yeah, I just want to add like to Zainab, it's very interesting because like your work, you know, essentially you're printing off of a printer. So obviously the, you know, the printer is going to print what you tell it to print, but th the ink is not going to listen to what you tell it to do, you know? So I think that's where, you know, Nasr is saying, okay, you have these conversations and you ask yourself, okay, um, am I going to let it drip longer? Am I going to, you know, let it, let the ink, you know, sway to one way? Am I going to? So I think it's interesting that all, all, all three of us, um, you know, we have this, we have a hand touch, you know, to the, the, the repetition, which, yeah, like allows us to ask, um, you know, how do we want to tweak it? So it's the same process, but yeah, we're tweaking it each time. Um, so I just thought that that was interesting when you were talking about printing the inks um, and then I guess just to talk about my piece then, <laughs> um, is that for me, it was, uh, yeah, like, you know, the overall theme is like, in order to understand a body, you must exhaust it to its full potential. And I feel like that's something that I've been, you know, working with my balloons and like, like you said, filling up, I've had so many balloons and plaster, like just splatter all over me, but that needed to happen in order for me to understand, okay, how much do I want to put in this balloon? Uh, how much air do I want to take out? Do I want, how does that, how does the making method of me incorporating my own body add to the narrative or take away from it? Um, you know, so I think that it all goes into through repetition and, and creating um, this process, you are yeah you're tweaking as you go in order to make conscious decisions about what you want to show and what you don't want to show i completely agree with them both i think with me um i'm very process based and i tend to work from a very subconscious place in my head and then work 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 until like i take a step back and like try and see like what happens or what is selling me so in the when i was working with repetition and creating the bricks what was super interesting to me was that I had the same mold. I had, I measured the same quantity over and over again. And I used like technically everything that I like, I kept on repeating the same sequence or like the um, method of making. But every time I would remove the brick from the mold and like examine the piece and see how it's reacting, it came out completely different. Some would be very strong and hard and could stand on their own and some would collapse immediately or I had one that I it had it was super rigid and like um, fully formed and I left it overnight without leaving it with the uh, lower layer of it and then when I came the next mor morning it was completely like due to gravity it sunk down and started sticking back to the uh, the other layer of it so it's completely like things that are not controllable in a sense so like time or gravity are things that I gravitate towards and trying to um, record these moments in which I can notice it or unnotice it. So I think like with me, I, I like stepping back and seeing like how or what does it tell me necessarily. Yeah. I think a lot of questions that came up was like, how long do I need to keep it? How many layers do I need to add? Um, how long do I keep it from one 
um, method to the other. So like I do the top part and then I do the top, the lower part. Do I do it instantly or like do I keep it for a few hours to dry completely? So a lot of like uh, uh, how to create questions came up to me. And talking about time and um, in this like exhaustive process, this hands-on process that you guys all went through, um, it's also a very laborious um, effect on the work as well. Could you talk a little bit how it like manifested physically in the final work, this exhaustive process that you guys went through? Yeah, so I will start. <laughs> um, to say that I have been on a journey is an understatement of the century. Um, I started up with something completely different that one than what I ended up uh, showing. I started with a different, somehow similar concept, but the method of making was different. So for me, it's always about the, uh, um, it's always about the uh, material explorations and uh, examining every material possible to see how, uh, how much or like what the material is telling me. So for me, when I see a material like um, a water bottle, I, it's something that's very basic, but when I look at it, I think of it as something that's uh, holding something or like something that's nourishing. So I always relate it to a, a feeling. Um, so thinking of that and trying to push that forward, I used as <laughs> like as much as I can, I the first, uh, phase of my uh, experimentation was purely material explorations. I used wood, resin, plaster, cement, uh, rubber, foam, literally everything. <laughs> so like seeing everything and trying to relate that or like how it might reflect back to, onto what I want to be telling or saying is uh, very important to me. So being hands-on with the material and just losing myself within it is very important of the process for me. Uh, and this artwork is what I was mentioning before about the alginate and having it um, using the same alginate mold and uh, recreating the same uh, face or relief over and over again to the point that it kept on losing a formation over time. Yeah. Sarah, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I think in my case, like the exhaustive sort of, you know, um, like it, the exhaustion just automatically manifested in the physical sense of my work. Um, you know, this piece um, is part of the three um, balloon sculptures that I have like at Warehouse 421 and with time, the latex is automatically like starting to, you know, rip um, due to the obviously the pressure, the temperature, all these things, you know? And so, um, yeah, like I just think it manifests physically um, in my work and um, it's, it's really exciting actually. At first, I know that I was very hesitant. I made all these extra balloons. I was like, no, I need to keep them in the studio. What if they break and burst? And then I actually like allowed the work to speak for itself and really, um, you know, take a form of its own. And I think it definitely, you know, um, worked in my favor and in the narrative, like it worked with my narrative rather than against uh, my narrative. So I'm actually pretty happy to see this. Um, I haven't gone to warehouse, so I don't know if more has ripped or not, but let's see. <laughs> For me, um, I think the process became more exhaustive or I tried to exhaust something in order to fit things together. And so I was interested first in the material. I had the concepts in mind a while back, but uh, I was also interested in the material because of its duality in this. And I thought like, okay, this is something that I could maybe reflect in the concept as well. So I began exhausting different ideas, different methods with the material, uh, acetate in that case and light and, and print as well. Um, trying to make it work. <laughs> so kind of forcing it together. Um, and eventually it did kind of, I did kind of find something and 
and just ran with it. Um, but also within the process itself, the idea just reinforces itself time and time again. Like as I stop, look at it, ask questions, change, reiterate. Um, and that's when <clears throat> I go like, okay, this is it. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, and I have one last question before we take questions from the audience. Um, I know this is a question that we get a lot, but you can take time to think about it before you answer, or maybe you've been thinking about it, um, who knows? Um, so the question is, how would you like to further the work that is currently on display for our um, show at Warehouse 421? It's been a few weeks since we let it breathe. <laughs> But there's always more since it's a uh, we, we're showing work that is in process and we're showing work that we showed during critique as well. It's a very different environment. So how would you like to further it? Anyone can start. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so definitely, I mean, I can I see the works obviously being displayed as a collective together, but 100 percent if I were to take them separately I can keep building you know off of that and I think with you know um the a feeling untitled that artwork it was um it was really hard for me to display it at the like to have it displayed at the stage that it was because I really wanted to create the you know have more of an impression on the memory foam I wanted the memory foam to feel uh heavy and so I was playing you know with resin and like different materials to try and like um freeze you know that action um, so I definitely want to continue working with memory foam and freezing, um, you know, a, a like that sort of forced gesture. Um, and they, even with the balloons, I definitely want to move forward and um, move away from plaster and like the latex. And I think that was great, but maybe work with different materials such as glass or ceramic. Um, I don't know, even, um, yeah, like just really, uh, really push the materiality, I think with each and I think that's how I would want to move forward so really exciting but also very nerve-wracking because um Seif has been such an amazing experience for all of us to kind of have the studio time and FaceTime and now it's kind of like you know um we we definitely have to have these conversations um within our own studios but Zoom is here to help right <laughs> to have these <laughs> virtual discussions. Of course, we're here for you, Sarah. <laughs> Yay! Um, for me, I uh, initially, I wanted to create the wall to be two meters high or like high enough. Um, but the thing with it, it's, it keeps on like falling down on me and also like time restrictions. So now that I don't have the time restrictions anymore, um, I can create as much bricks as I can and <laughs> bury myself in it. <laughs> So like, um, I, I see myself creating it or making it bigger. Um, I also would like to see if I can make the latex bricks fully um, made instead of like having them hollow. Um, and yeah, and just like going on with the material explorations and seeing like which material is spoken, speaking to me and which one is uh, uh, making me gravi gravitate towards to speak about my narrative and my work. Fatma, are you, um, are you fine with the wall kind of falling down? Um, it fell on me. I tested it at home and it fell on me again in the warehouse while assembling it. I think I am okay with it. Um, I don't want to be too precious about the work. I, I want to be open to mistakes to happen to be able to learn from it and see like what it can um, bring out or teach me or like maybe there is something that can come out from it of it like uh, falling down. So like I can also imagine it like fully or not half for it to be like half built and then like somehow fallen down. So I'm, I'm open to it. I'm not, uh, I'm not too, uh, yeah. Um, uh, furthering work. So for me, 
And now that I've had time to let it breathe in the show, um, I actually don't know where to go <laughs> or take the work too. Um, as opposed to while I was being engrossed in the process, I had so many questions that I wanted to try out, so many different ideas to try and keep going because I was essentially interested in um, making the or making the, uh, the print or a show the translucency. Um, so as opposed to just printing only a scan. Um, but we had to stop that for the show. Um, and, but now that I've had like time away from it, um, I don't know. I think, um, I would have to like sit down for a while and just look at the work again, as opposed to being busy with other things. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks guys. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from um, the audience. So uh, Mariam, do you wanna mute and ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah, sure. Um, you guys probably answered this uh, along the way, but I just wanted to ask again, um, at what point of the process or during the repetition did you think that, okay, I think that this is enough and I should stop, or you thought that, no, I, I need to create more, this is not enough. Um, I know it might be different for all three of you, but, you know, was it more of a process of elimination or were you, uh, you know, limited to a certain time frame? Um, yeah, I just want to know more about that. Okay, I guess I'll go. Um, in my case, it was, I obviously, yeah, like deadlines, I, I love them because they literally are a stopping point. It's like, without deadlines, I could just keep going and go off track and I'll have like multiple things that eventually... I don't even know if they would have a common ground. Um, but yeah, so for me, it was, I really just allowed myself to uh, make as much as possible. And then I would give myself like a, at least a week, you know, or if I'd make excessively for four days, I take like two days to kind of breathe and then be like, okay, let me reflect and see, is this, you know, working for me? Is it not working? Um, is making more, uh, Nasr is like, Nasr always tells me to stop so sometimes he I was tells gonna me say me. I was yeah. gonna say sometimes it's just me telling her to stop and go exactly home. so sometimes you just need a Nasr in your life to tell you when to stop or else you can just keep going um but yeah so I think honestly it's good to have um you know your own deadlines to be like okay I'm gonna give myself a week to keep repeating the process or I'm gonna give myself a week to keep researching or keep playing with materiality and then move on to something else because um i think that you know by by focusing on on maybe two or different things at once can actually benefit um instead of focusing on one thing for just so long so i don't know if that really answered the question i think the answer would be find yourself an author um but yeah i completely agree with sarah um for me it was mostly about time um, the pieces that are shown in the warehouse right now are two months worth of work. So every brick would take me five hours to create. So I really was head bent into creating as much as I can. Um, other than that, I feel like, as Sarah mentioned, you sometimes can get lost within the process. So it's good to have different things to work on at the same time. So you wouldn't lose your perspective or um, get lost in it. So going, uh, working on something and then leaving to do something else is really important. So when you come back, you would have a new perspective and fresh eyes to look into the work. Um, uh, um, so yeah. I'm gonna say time or the deadline was what stopped me, um, but also uh, it was just finding a balance between something that's 
legible and not so legible for the portraits that is um but also at the same time um during that process um i had used exhausted this one printer for all of these 24 prints and then i looked at them and like no <laughs> this ain't it and so i went to the other printer that was in studio and i went ahead and I was like, yes, I'm really happy with this. Yeah, definitely. And I was just about to finish. And then I stop and I look again. And then, ah, no. <laughs> and so um, it was more about, yeah, again, finding that balance. And that's what happened with me. Uh, and that's what made me keep going. Just like, very picky about details and things like that. Um, yeah, it was also a process of illumination as well, because uh, I had two options. I have so many options, but yeah. <clears throat> and we're gonna take one more question from Azim. Uh, do you wanna unmute Azim? Thank you everyone, that was really awesome. Um, and thank you for your generosity. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess it sounds like a very similar question to the previous one of like knowing when to stop, but I'm thinking more specifically about materially, right? So um, I know a lot of you talked about the process being what is actually what you think of as repeating, um, and that sounds cyclical, which is also great. Um, but I was thinking about how do you when being able to access material so easily or having a studio and this team and wanting to make things and it's also exciting, how do you know that you're not um, uh, just making to make or like do you are making an abundance because it's easy or you're making an abundance because you can? So how do you think about that thing? Not that I'm expecting like a concrete answer or like oh, I believe in this, but I just wonder how you're approaching that, how you set I guess, uh, ecological considerations in your practices. Thank you, Adley, for your question. Um, for me, if I had to choose and like um, creating it or not, I would probably say because of like how long and hard and the process was certainly not easy, um, I wouldn't say that it was easy. Um, I think that um, uh, like it was very, I didn't have the space, I didn't have the materials, I ran out of the material at the end. So it was like really a matter of creating to have the fully concept shown properly instead of like feeling that it is missing something or that I am putting it in a way that will take away from the work. Um, I haven't considered the ecological aspects of it, considering that we were working with materials and like fumes and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I will take into consideration moving forward. Um, Adim, I just want to say I really miss you. Seriously, like we miss having you around. Um, so, and also thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm just going to touch uh, more on, you know, the, when you were saying like, uh, making in terms of like, making for the sake of making for the program or making because you want to make or making because you feel inspired or, you know, uh, making just in general, I think, honestly, being a part of Seif, um, it's really, really taught me. And I think um, a lot of other people too, um, we're totally going to get to like take you up on the studio visits just saying um so yeah I think that, <laughs> I think that it's really really important to just make and don't have expectations when you make allow yourself to make um without overthinking and just know that you're gonna make a lot of stuff that you're not gonna be happy with and that's okay but through that process of making you're going to find things that interest you and when you do wait literally I have like I have four sketchbooks. Okay, I can't find them. Um, but what I do is I'll literally will take a picture, I'll print it, I'll put it in my sketchbook and I'll write something about it. 
Um, I do a lot of research on the side, you know, on, on artists, on materials, and sometimes that doesn't go anywhere, but then sometimes I, it does go somewhere. And um, I think that, yeah, like the CIF has definitely taught me and is just to keep making regardless. Like, obviously, yes, when it comes to final work, you need to think, you need to obviously, you know, understand what you're making. Um, but in the process, it's fine to just really not know and put like, post your work out there and and yeah like have people comment and have people you know give them your their give you their opinions and see whether or not spark something I don't know um I'm gonna agree with Sarah about researching and looking at other artists works I think that actually helps with um your own process as well um also doing studio visits, um, having mentors around uh, people who you think will help you or um, in your artist practice. I think that would help me from going somewhere where event the process will become excessive and, and then it would just become very, just like you said, eco ecologically like, indulgent um, other than that if I'm alone <laughs> I don't think I would make work I probably would like just stop because I usually live in my head but um, that's the ideal answer just having people around you to give you crits or and, and I um, feedback at looking and just constantly reading so yeah. <clears throat> I will do. No. Um, all right. So I think we're gonna end the session there. I just wanted to say thank you all for attending. Um, and a special thank you to the artists for their time, their honesty, their generosity. And um if you haven't seen the show yet, it is up until December 20th. Mondays are closed at Warehouse. And if you're unable to make it to Abu Dhabi, there is a beautiful walkthrough that is on the Warehouse 4 to 1 account. Um, and there will be one more artist talk in two weeks time, December 14th at 7 p.m., where we'll have another three artists from CIF Cohort 7. Uh, so watch out for that. You can book, um, or you can actually see the Zoom link already posted on Warehouse 421's website and also on my Instagram account. So yeah, and if you wanna catch up on anything else, the archive of artist talks <laughs> is on YouTube. Self-promotion right there. Um, yeah, so thank you all for joining. Bye. <laughs>